Okay, okay. And it works, yes. Um, so far. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about the uh, scientific accomplishment of Shor's Lemaitre, especially uh, with regard to cosmology. But first, I uh, need to introduce him, uh, say a few uh, remarks concerning his uh, biography. Charles, uh, George uh, Eduard Lemaitre was born in 1894 in Charleroi, in Belgium. He grew up uh, with uh, his two uh, brothers, and we have them here, and believe me or not, these are brothers, not sisters. Uh, he attended uh, a Jesuit school uh, in his primary and secondary education, and um, uh, then he went on to an uh, engineering uh, college in order to become a mining engineer. Uh, but that didn't happen, he didn't complete his engineering uh, education. Uh, a world war came in between. In uh, 1914, uh, the fall of 1914, German troops invaded Belgium and uh, Schorsch uh, uh, volunteered for the Belgium army immediately. And it so happened that for more than four years he was in uniform, uh, participating in one of the fiercest battles of uh, this terrible war. Uh, so it was only in uh, early 1919 that he returned to civilian life, uh, now switching from uh, engineering studies to studies of mathematics and physics. And uh, what, was, what is most uh, remarkable in the very same period, he uh, began studies at a seminary, uh, theological studies. So he uh, uh, he studied mathematics and physics on the one hand and theology on the other. Uh, in 1923 he was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church, of course, and throughout his life he followed a dual career, one in the service of the church and the other in the service of the sciences. He was fortunate enough in uh, 1923 to receive a traveling fellowship uh, which uh, brought him to England first, to Cambridge, where he studied under uh, no other than uh, uh, Arthur Eddington for nearly a year. Then he crossed the Atlantic. He went to the east coast of the US, where he continued his doctoral studies at Harvard and at MIT, where he wrote his PhD. But uh, at that time, uh, when he was in the US, uh, he also visited uh, Hubble in California, and Slifer in Arizona. Uh, because one of the things which uh, fascinated young George was the uh, relatively recent discovered galactic redshifts. So let me just mention that uh, Melvin Slifer in 1912 had measured the first galactic redshift, which was actually a blue shift, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, in the mid 1920s, some 40 redshifts were known. Uh, and uh, many people speculated that there probably was some relationship uh, between uh, the redshifts, the magnitude of the redshift, and the distances to the galaxies. But unfortunately, uh, one didn't know with any kind of precision the distances to the galaxies. So here we have the best data from 1924, compiled by a Swedish uh, astronomer, Knut Lundmark. And uh, I think you will agree with me if I say that it takes a very good will to see a straight line uh, through these data points. Uh, nonetheless, there were these speculations and after Hubble had succeeded in determining the distance to the Andromeda and, uh, and, and the other galaxies, uh, interest in this subject increased and uh, when uh, Schorsch returned to Belgium, where he was appointed professor of astrophysics in 1926 or 7. Uh, he composed his, his masterful uh, article, uh, possibly uh, the most important, certainly one, one of the most important papers in 20th century cosmology. I need to say a little about it, but I can only uh, say a little. Uh, this was the paper in which the expanded universe was predicted definitely predicted. 
I cannot go into the question of whether uh, Friedman had predicted it earlier, but uh, he didn't. Uh, we have a very definite prediction in a realistic sense, in the sense that Lemaitre argued by means of data, the redshift data, Friedman did mention this data at all, uh, that the universe is in fact expanding. Uh, moreover, uh, he was able to calculate what became known as the Hopper constant or the Hopper parameter, but with some historical justification might have become uh, the Lemaitre constant. And he obtained a uh, value of uh, roughly 600 uh, kilometer per second per megaparsec. And, uh, and you can see here, if you can see anything, uh, that he mentioned these and he is, uh, gives his calculations here. Uh, the other thing I need to say is that this paper was singularly unsuccessful from a social point of view. I and other people have looked in vain for a single citation to that paper from 1927 to 1930. As far as I can tell, nobody cited that paper, nor did Lemaitre himself, for that matter. Uh, it became very famous, though, in 1930 when it was rediscovered, so to speak, uh, by Eddington and De Sitter and translated, partially translated, this page was missing, among other things, uh, uh, into English in the month, monthly notices. Um, as far as the Hopper constant uh, is concerned, I will only mention very briefly, because it's, uh, it's, it's well known, uh, that uh, this uh, fundamental constant has decreased over time uh, in this uh, quite drastic manner. And it's only fairly recently that we have uh, got very reli reliable and precise uh, measurements. But you can see that the, uh, the uh, uh, prediction by, uh, by uh, uh, Lemaitre didn't, was of the same order as, as the Hubble, or rather the hubble humerson value uh, of about 1930. It's important to be aware, and not all people are aware of it, that uh, this model of the expanding, expanding, <laughs> expanding universe was not of the Big Bang type. It's sometimes stated that the Big Bang dates from this article. It doesn't. It does, it's dates from 1931. So there are two Lemaitre models, so to speak. Uh, this is the model of 1927. It's sometimes known as the lemaitre eddington model because Eddington in 1930 uh, refined it and uh, developed it with some of his collaborators, but it's basically the same model. And uh, this model doesn't have a Big Bang. It starts in an Einstein state, and then due to some instability, it expands. Um, but in uh, 1931, uh, Lemaitre took the next step, so to speak, a very drastic uh, step, namely to postulate that um, the age of the universe is finite. The universe hasn't always existed. Uh, there was a time in which all matter was condensed in a kind of a proto-universe, uh, which is the qualitative idea of the Big Bang. Of course, he didn't use that term. Uh, the term he used was uh, l'atome primitif, the primeval or primordial uh, atom. Uh, of course, atom is a rather unfortunate term. He should have said the atomic nucleus, and perhaps this was what he thought about. But anyway, he, he uh, in, 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 in a rather qualitative uh, way, he had the idea that uh, there was a time before which we cannot reach, in principle, uh, in which everything was packed into one single quantum, as he called it. And, uh, uh, so he describes this idea as a primeval atom uh, hypothesis. And uh, this is a later illustration from one of the works of, of, of Lemaitre. We have the Big Bang, let's call it that here. Uh, and then it expands rapidly. Then there comes a fairly long phase, so-called stagnation phase, which was due to the cosmological constant to which I shall return. Um, um, this was 1931. and. Uh, if one wants a precise origin of that 
suggestion. Uh, it would be a very small uh, letter in Nature of uh, 9 May 1931. In, we have it here. I cannot uh, go into it. It's, it's 500 words, that's all. It's not a scientific paper. It's a kind of uh, poetic um, idea. Uh, but it's interesting in, in many ways. One of the reasons why it is, it is interesting is that he, his, uh, as you can see in the title, he's appealing to quantum theory. And uh, uh, at the end of his paper, his, um, so to speak, he's avoiding the ghost of determinism uh, by appealing to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So he, he's taking seriously the idea that the very early universe, before it exploded, so to speak, was governed by, somehow was governed by quantum mechanics. It's also interesting to note that he's not signing this letter as Professor uh, Lemaitre, University of Louvain, etc. He's signing it, it as a private person, giving his private address. Um, it's also interesting that uh, in his uh, archival material, which is as you found at, uh, in the archive in uh, Louvain de la Neuve, uh, we have his um, typewritten manuscript for this uh, interesting uh, letter. And as you can see, that is where he starts, where he stops in his published version of it. But originally, he added a reference to God and the divinely created universe, which of course made very good sense for a Catholic priest. And of course, uh, Lemaitre did believe that the universe was divinely created. Um, but it's, 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 it's interesting because he's not using this idea as a kind of justification of a divinely created uh, universe, quite the contrary. Uh, anyway, we have this idea. And um, so by 1931, uh, this is definitely the birth of the Big Bang idea. I mentioned very briefly and emphasizing that Lemaitre's idea was realistic. He did believe and did argue that the one and only real universe had a beginning in time, a kind of violent beginning. At the, roughly at the, very, at, at the same time, we have Einstein. Uh, when he had given up his belief in the cosmological constant, Einstein published uh, at the very same time uh, this model, which is not very well known, a kind of cyclic uh, universe which also formally is of the Big Bang type. And of course, the einstein de Sitter universe, much better known from 1932, again formally, is of the Big Bang type. But none of these authors, Einstein and de Sitter, mention that at all. Uh, in their paper, they did not refer to the uh, age of the universe. They didn't give the relationship between the Hubble t time and, uh, and, and, and and, and, and the age. So they didn't take the uh, beginning seriously at all. Um, and uh, as far I might mention, as far as Eddington was concerned, Eddington was, of course, one of the uh, very great and influential uh, leaders of relativistic cosmology at the time. Uh, he kept to the uh, older Lemaitre model, the Eddington uh, Lemaitre model, he didn't like uh, uh, Lemaitre's idea of an explosive beginning at all. And he never came to like it for various reasons, uh, in part uh, philosophical and to some extent also religious, I believe. Anyway, this uh, idea, which we undoubtedly would call a great and uh, epochal idea today was not received kindly. And that is an understatement. It was well known, however, but much more so in the popular and semi-popular literature than in the scientific literature. Uh, it's important for, well, here we have a, a very interesting article. Uh, at the time, the 19, in the interwar period, there was a large number of uh, popular science journals, probably even more than there is today. And uh, one of the more serious one, Popular Science Monthly, we have an article by Donald Menzel, and a respected uh, Harvard astronomer, 
uh, which gives in great detail and with great understanding uh, an expose of Lemaitre's uh, explosion uh, hypothesis. It's very interesting in many ways. It's very positive to, uh, to the idea. And one of the interesting things is the picture you have in the upper, upper right corner. You may not recognize what this is, and I cannot recognize whom this person is, but I'm pretty sure that it's Ernest Lawrence, uh, the famous American experimental physicist and the designer of the cyclotron. And this is indeed the first uh, generation of the cyclotron, the atom-smashing machine in which one was able to generate a high energy uh, projectiles and make a lot of nuclear reactions. Uh, so this um, article emphasizes that the, there, there is an analogy between what the nuclear physicists do when they transform the elements from one to another and then to what happened in the very early universe. Uh, why should people believe in uh, Lemaitre's crazy idea? Uh, Lemaitre realized that if there were no fossils from this hypothetical original explosion, uh, then it would remain a postulate. It couldn't be examined empirically. And that, of course, was one reason why it wasn't received kindly. Uh, so uh, Lemaitre had this idea uh, in 1931 and later throughout the 1930s that the cosmic rays were the fossils of the Big Bang. Maybe not the, of the original Big Bang, but when the stars were formed. Uh, you should be aware that in the 1930s, the cosmic rays were about the hottest in, in, in uh, what we call high energy physics, elementary particle physics. Uh, several Nobel Prizes were given uh, to, to, the, to, uh, to the area, and um, it, it was a field which was uh, controversial. And uh, according to Lemaitre, the cosmic rays consisted of charged particles. Uh, such as Compton and other people argued, and they had their origin, uh, they, they were of cosmological origin. Um, as, he, as he wrote, uh, uh, the cosmic rays give some experimental support to the theory of super radioactive origin of the cosmic radiation. Because when the original uh, primeval atom exploded, uh, Lemaitre described it as a super radioactive decay. And for this reason, an acausal process. Uh, so he did uh, some uh, very serious work in cosmic ray physics, calculating uh, the orbits of the um, electrically charged particles supposed to come from the Big Bang, and how these, art, uh, uh, how, <coughs> how these particles would uh, move in the magnetic field of the Earth. These kind of uh, calculations, and certainly at that time, were terribly complicated. Uh, he collaborated with a Mexican-American uh, a theorist by the name uh, Velata, and, um, and he made, uh, Lemaitre and Velata uh, made these uh, uh, calculations. Uh, I should say uh, that uh, throughout his life, and especially in the later part of his life, uh, Lemaitre apart from having this deep interest in cosmology and general relativity, he was also fascinated by calculations, any kind of mathematical cal calculations. And uh, the more difficult, the better. So he, uh, he was a user of uh, uh, computers uh, at a very early time, and uh, uh, he and Velata used uh, state-of-the-art computer technology at the time. This was a semi-mechanical computer, but it was the most powerful uh, in the pre-World War II days, um, uh, invented by Vannevar Bush. And uh, later on in his life, uh, I believe that Lemaitre was the first one who introduced uh, elect no, well, uh, transistor-based computers uh, in Belgium. He spent a lot of time uh, in that area, uh, whether connected with cosmology or not. Uh, so I said that uh, this primeval atom idea was not well received. Uh, throughout the 1930s, 
I would say that maybe two persons accepted the idea, two scientists, or one and a half, maybe, except for Lemaitre himself, of course. Um, so here we have um, a couple of, uh, m most people either ignored the idea or they wrote it off. Some ridiculed it. And here we have two uh, responses of the, uh, uh, of the latter type. Uh, William Barnes was a bishop of Birmingham, but apart from that he was uh, a trained uh, mathematician and he knew a lot of uh, uh, general relativity and cosmology, so he was an insider, so to speak, and in 1931, he's, no, 1933, in a remarkable book, he, write, he <coughs> characterizes as a brilliantly clever shudderspy, and not a sober reconstruction of the beginning of the world. John Plaskett, a Canadian observational uh, astronomer, says pretty much the same in somewhat stronger terms, it's the wildest speculations of all. An example of a speculation run mad without a shred of evidence to support it. And of course, there wasn't much su support. Uh, the idea of the cosmic rays as a kind of cosmological background turned out to be wrong. Uh, so, uh, in a sense, there was no good reason to uh, believe in Lemaitre's theory uh, at the time. Uh, and it should also be emphasized that the very idea of a, of a beginning of a, of a universe uh, had a totally different status at the time that it, that it has today. Uh, it was widely seen as, uh, not a scientific, but a philosophical idea, which it is perhaps, uh, something which uh, shouldn't enter a serious scientific theory. So, just to give one more example, uh, Richard Tolman uh, at Caltech, prob one of the most uh, respected and the, one of the greatest specialists at the time uh, who wrote the first uh, major textbook in cosmology ever, Relativity, Thermodynamics and, and Cosmology. Uh, here we have uh, Tolman together with Einstein and Frau Elsa. Uh, and his saying, I mean, his, his referring to Lemaitre explicitly when he uh, makes these uh, statements. Uh, so he accepts that there are, of course, uh, Big Bang uh, solutions to the cosmological field equations, but to have a Big Bang solution is totally different from saying that universe actually started in a Big Bang, such as Lemaitre did believe. Uh, one of the uh, great problems uh, which played cosmology in the 1930s and 40s was a so-called timescale problem. And, uh, uh, and the reason is that uh, if one uh, calculated the age of the universe according to the uh, uh, relativistic uh, models, one came up with an age of the universe which was uh, less, much less than the age of the stars and the galaxies. And that's not so good. Um, Lemaitre, in a, in a way, solved this problem by introducing the cosmological constant. And I need to say something about this famous constant, uh, which at the time was perhaps more infamous than famous, uh, and had a very different status than it has today. Uh, and the reason is that um, uh, Lemaitre was, throughout his career, very much convinced that uh, the cosmological constant is real, that is positive, and is needed not only for, co for cosmological purposes, but also for other purposes, uh, because he suggested that it made a connection between uh, nuclear and particle physics, quantum physics on the one hand, and cosmology uh, on the other. So there's, uh, there's no doubt that, <coughs> that Lemaitre uh, should be regarded uh, as one of the fathers, or perhaps one of the grandfather, grandfathers of the concept of dark energy. Um, in 1933, he, when he was again in the US, he traveled widely in the, in, in the 1930s, he was giving a talk uh, to the um, uh, 
Academy of Science in Washington, D.C., and uh, it was published in the Proceedings of that Academy. It's not well known, but it's, uh, uh, it's a very important paper uh, because, uh, as you can see, uh, he argues explicitly uh, that the cosmological constant, apart from a constant in the field equations, it also has the physical significance that it signifies the energy density of the vacuum. And it's associated with a negative pressure. And he's saying that quite explicitly. And so on. Um, so, so uh, uh, in the early 1930s, not only Le Maitre, but also De Sitter, by the way, uh, were uh, protagonists of the idea of, of a positive uh, cosmological constant. But of course, Einstein uh, was not. Uh, whether the uh, often cited remark that he was the biggest blunder in his life is correct, and it probably isn't. Uh, he, uh, in 1931, he decided that there was not need for, no need for the constant, and that it was a mistake that he had introduced it in 1917. But of course, uh, uh, Lemaitre didn't agree at all. Uh, in 1949, Einstein could celebrate his 70th year's birthday, and there was uh, published a big issue in a series called Living Philosophers, uh, with a number of uh, prestigious scientists invited to contribute to that volume. One of them was Lemaitre, who wrote a chapter on the cosmological constant. And as preparation for this paper, uh, um, uh, Lemaitre and Einstein exchanged a couple of, uh, of letters, which are very interesting, these letters, because they show their different mental attitudes in some respects. Uh, here is the letter from, part of the letter from, Einstein, from Lemaitre to Einstein, uh, 47, and he is saying that, uh, that this constant, the cosmological constant, uh, is a happy accident. It's certainly not a blunder, it was a happy accident, it's something which uh, needed to be there. And Einstein, uh, he, um, uh, he responds that, uh, no, I had a bad conscience, I always found it very ugly indeed. So uh, it's very typical in this uh, exchange of letters that um, their arguments and counter-arguments with regards to the cosmological constants are very much subjective and aesthetic. Um, they, they had no uh, very good um, empirical reasons to argue, except for the timescale difficulty, to uh, come up with uh, an argument. Um, so in the... <coughs> I'll just say that in the 1930s, although Lemaitre's idea was not generally accepted, far from. Uh, uh, he was very well known in the community. There was no cosmological co community at the time, but in the physics and astronomy community he was very well uh, respected. He traveled widely. I'll just give one example of it. Very interesting symposium which was held at the Notre Dame University. Uh, uh, Lemaitre was a visiting professor at the time and there was arranged this um, uh, this uh, meeting on the physics of the universe and the nature of primordial particles, which has a very modern ring. It's the first time ever that there was a symposium of that kind uh, of subject. Uh, Lemaitre, the problem of the expanding of the universe, several others, a couple of Nobel Prize laureates, Anderson and Compton, Shapley, and so on. Um, after World War II, um, um, Lemaitre um, scaled down his, um, his work in, co in, co in cosmology and what is uh, rather ununderstandable to me and most other people, he didn't pay any attention when George Gamow and his group uh, revived the uh, Big Bang theory and worked it out in much greater uh, detail and turned it into a uh, really a scientific theory and not just a hypothesis. Uh, but he was uh, well known and uh, I will just uh, uh, point out that in 1958 
the venerable uh, Solvay Conference was first established in 1911, uh, held its first um, meeting on a, a non-physics subject. Uh, it was on uh, cosmology, uh, galaxies, and, um, and general relativity. Uh, these people are, of course, uh, invited. And uh, here we have some of them. Uh, we have Lemaitre here. But he was the only one at the time who defended uh, the Big Bang model. Uh, as you can see, 1958 was a time when nobody could say with any certainty whether we live in a steady state theory, uh, universe or a, in a Big Bang uh, evolving uh, universe. And you can see that uh, the major four people within the steady state theory, including uh, Fred Hoyle, who we have here, uh, Bondi, Gold, and uh, McRae, uh, they were represented uh, at that meeting. I would like to end with, um, uh, with a recent uh, observation of mine, because for the moment I'm uh, examining uh, the archi archival material in Stockholm of the Nobel uh, archive, and uh, you probably don't know that Lemaitre did receive two nominations for the Nobel Prize. Uh, he didn't receive the prize though, this is the last slide. Uh, but he was nominated in 1954 uh, uh, for his expansion of the universe, and then uh, uh, two years later for the uh, explosion theory. Uh, strangely, but for reasons like there was no need to come, he was nominated for the prize in chemistry. And Lemaitre had absolutely nothing to do with chemistry. But just to make sure, I checked his bibliography, and he has written one chemical paper. We have it here. He only entered as a calculator. Thank you for your attention.